we are going to bring up something that makes me happy. And, and yes, it's something that deals with death, resurrection, and all kinds of stuff. Because back in the late 80s, a certain independent comic company put out one of the greatest comic books of that era, which led to a movie that was destined for VHS had not Brandon Lee died, unfortunately. I Even though I love The Crow, I love the soundtrack, I think that The Crow's soundtrack would have made a lot of money, but I don't think that The Crow in the um, theaters would have made a lot of money, unfortunately. It's, that has nothing to do with what I think of the movie. I love the movie, but that's just the way we were back in the 90s. We grab it, kind of like we are now, kind of gravitate towards death and controversy. So, um, and, le- and let me also, this I was alive when this was written. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> All right, so uh, the crow. This, this, um, I think I was fourteen when I read this, and this was one of the first comics because you know at that age it was DC Marvel, DC Marvel, and a few other things. The Crow was one of the first non-superhero comic books I ever read, and the thing about when I read The Crow, even though I it was six years later, I think before the movie came out, maybe seven years. That was about five. It was five years. It was uh, ninety. It was eighty nine to ninety four. So that yeah, was a yeah, five year gap. Five years. I could hear the soundtrack that should be with this movie while I'm reading this. It it was the first comic that I bought that I actually paid for with my own money. That was an all black and white. Obviously, it had color covers and covers, but it was an all black and white. It was at the time, other than Alien Legion, which was not as bad, the most violent comic I, I bought. And it dealt with issues um, because it was an independent. It dealt with issues that you just didn't see in a, in a, in a superhero comic or in a, in a DC or in a Marvel comic. We didn't have Image at the time. Image was still three years away from being created. There was no Spawn. So, you know, the whole resurrection theme was done differently in comic books. If somebody came back from, from light, you know, to life, it was because of like, you know, Galactus or somebody or somebody cosmic brought them back or the Grandmaster. It wasn't like this. There was no mythology to it, to those kind of books back then. What made The Crow so different is it was it was stark violence and hatred and revenge. That's what it started out as. And then as you because the, the comic opens up that way, it pretty much the same way like the way the movie does. Before you get a chance to know Eric Draven, before you get a chance to know what life means to any of these guys, this tor- the story is told in such an order where that's all gone now. You enter in the story from the point of view of his hatred and his revenge and his sole mission to 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 his what his one night that he's brought back to right that wrong, and you sort of feel sorry for the criminals because he he puts it to him. He puts it to him, but the brutality, that's the word I'm looking for, the, the brutality of the crow, it has everything that, that comics in 1989 didn't have. I mean, we were still going, getting over the controversy of what was going on in the Killing Joke a year prior, right? The crow, yeah. there's rape involved, there's murder involved, there's gang rape involved, there's, there's you know, people getting shot, you know, there's a, there's a line in there where, you know, the guy who kills Eric Draven to start off with his he's saying that his, his, his uh, head's still smoking from the shotgun blast. This was in 1989. Now, for those of you, well, obviously a lot, you know, if I'm not going to assume everybody knows, of course, so I'll go ahead and explain the pro is uh, the story of Eric Draven, who is killed by a group of thugs and his girlfriend is raped. He's killed. He's thrown out of a window. Um, in, 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 the, in the movie that you know he's thrown out of a window um, he's left for dead he dies and the crow which is the spirit that we talked about in depth a couple of days ago that picks and chooses and brings back a particular person so that that person can get their vengeance and why they're empowered by the crow they can't die they can't be harmed and they are to go after those that, that, that cause their death and cause their pain. And that's exactly what he does. The Crow film that was released in 1994, to this day, in my opinion, is the most accurate comic book movie ever made. Given its content and given, you know, there's one aspect of the movie that I, I wish they could have found a way to do voiceovers or whatever. Uh, and, I, and when I watched the Sandman TV show, I see that they could have with Matthew. And that's the Crow in the movie should have talked. Because what he's saying to him throughout the series is very important in my opinion. What he's saying to him, there's a, there's a, um, there's a scene where he's remembering or right at the point where 
he's been shot. And in, uh, in the in the comic book, I don't think he's doing the movie. It's comic book. He's shot. He's out in the uh, he's out in the, uh, the the forest. They're attacked out in a, in a park somewhere, and they're raping his girlfriend, and he's still alive. He's still smoking. He's still alive, and the crow already knows he's gonna die. That's when you first see the crow, and the crow is like, "Turn away. It'll be, we'll get him later. It's all gonna be over." So the crow is consoling him and bridging him from the land of the living to what he's going to become later on, a year later, when he's resurrected and he goes after these fools. And the crow keeps him focused. So the movie is lacking that. And I guess in the 90s, that would have been, they, I guess they, they thought that would have been a little bit too far, talking bird. But now, we, like I said, we have Matthew, and that works. You know, I, I don't know if I would use, um, What's his face? Oswald, uh, whatever. Like, I forgot his name, but you know who he is. The guy who does a voice for Matthew and the Crow, or not in the Crow and the Sandman. I would probably get a different voice. Hey, you know, maybe Morgan Freeman. I don't know. Um, but uh, that's the only thing in the movie that really, and plus how he dies. Uh, in the movie, it's different. There, you know, it, the rape and everything happens, but I believe in the in the, in the movie, in the movie, he's thrown out of the window and he dies that way. Um, and she does survive. You know, and the cop that plays by is played by Bernie Hudson stays with her. And he uses those thoughts, you know, against his enemy at the end. Um, the, it is this is the turning point story, and a lot of these turning points. And now that we got our patron and everything else turned up, I'm going to leave the very next one I do next week. I'm going to leave that up to you guys because although the, the crow was a turning point for me as a comic book fan, this this one was like I said, it introduced me into what kind of comics you could make when you didn't have a DC or a Marvel editor saying, "Oh no, we can't do that." So since you were alive during this one, what did you think <laughs> about the, the crow? Uh, yeah, the crow. So, I mean, I think you've uh, kind of outlined. A, I, I think it, I think you've pretty well covered it there. Where it's like, yeah, this was very off the beaten path from everything that you you would see in like DC or Marvel. Like we said, Image hadn't come around yet. So, you know, you were it was dealing in themes that uh, you know that were very that were very mature and were very that, that was pushing the envelope for the time a lot. So, you know, and talking about the, of course the movie that came out of it you know, with Brandon Lee. I mean, and yeah, it's like, I, I think that <laughs> what you say about it being like the most like one-to-one -one transition. I mean, it's like, I, I could definitely, I could definitely see that because, you know, they, they really, they took great pains to really like bring this kind of imagery, you know, to life, you know, in the crow. And uh, for the most part, you know, carried over a lot of the, uh, a lot of the kind of grat the, the more adult content, more, more mature thematic elements and uh and of course the whole thing with just it being just this so centered on just the the, the dichotomy of life and death so it's like yeah the crow i mean you, yeah what else can you say about it it's just it's 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 a seminal work outside of like the marvel and dc framework yeah and at a time where this wasn't like the 90s and everything where everything just got kind of watered down the, the this was this was a good time to be a comic book fan as far as a store owner i was five ish five six years away from owning my own place but i was buying comic books at my my the lone word comics in san Bernardino, where i'm from and like i said that is why i became a, a store owner because of my influence there and this was got recommended to me and you know my dad trusted um gary and mike who ran my store not to give me anything that i couldn't handle he knew him and we, we, you know, he would leave me there all day Saturday. I would literally, no joke, when I was a teenager, I wasn't one of the cool kids. I'm not one of the cool adults, so you can probably figure that one out now. <laughs> but life for me, enjoyment for me, is dropping me off at 11 o'clock on Saturday and picking me up at, at seven, uh, 6 or 7 o'clock on, on, on Saturday night. That was that was that's all we did was we, we talked about comic books and we would have people that would rotate in to come pick up their subscriptions and they would be coming in there for five minutes and we it ended up talking to them for like an hour and then that's how it happened and then that's how the crow got introduced to me because we were talking about like you know comics you know we wish comics were a little bit that didn't hold back and then a guy pulls out the counter and says you need to start reading this this doesn't hold back yeah yeah and it does not hold back and like I said. I had watched enough horror movies and movies of that like to understand, you know, to take it, what I was reading into context. The crow blew me away. The artwork blew me away. The black and whiteness of it is just, it's, there was no, you could, all the details were there. All the, the horrible details of her being raped, her, the, you know, him being shot up that way. And then, how and that's he a, basically, and that's a unique thing for its time, you know, selling something, 
you know, to that level of, of success on a, you know, on black and white where it's yeah. where there, you don't, where you're not having, you know, like the vibrant, you know, X-Men kind of color scheme to it. Yeah. They're called four color fantasies for a reason. And you did, you only had black and white and be honest with you in hindsight, I couldn't, I, I I'm glad that they did it that way because it, when you read the crow, it hits like a punch. It hits like a punch. And then the cool thing about the crow is, is as you start to see, because they tell it out of sequence sometimes, as you start to see. Now, the one thing that the movie does not do, because it only has a, a, a limited amount of time to do so, is it shows you the humanity that he lost. Because when you see the crow and he goes about killing, he's like, this is a cold-blooded mofo. You need people to deserve to die. Fuck him. But when you see the flashbacks and you see the flashback storylines, and you see the poems and stuff that he's writing, you see all the stuff that J.O. Barr puts into this, you realize that this was a human, that the crow is everything that he was not, but everything he needs to be for this one night to take his revenge. He gets one night, and then he goes back to the grave. I think the story does an excellent job of not only showing you the contrast of what he has become and what the bird has done to him, but it also shows you that his humanity was lost and the only way he can get peace. And the whole story is about people. And, and this is a big thing in the eighties, people finding peace after violent crimes, people who've lost people, people who've been, been tragically harmed by violent crimes. This, this was about um, sewing up the loose ends and finding peace where it differs from a lot of the movies and stuff that happened in the eighties is the person that, that, you know, also was killed. You're, you're telling this story from the point of a dead man who has to re-engage with his humanity to understand why he needs these people to die, which is ironic. So I love this story. It is one of the um, crucial turning points uh, uh, for me. I hope it Well, you know, I, I think it was in general. I, it, there was a movie made out of it. And then all the reprints and everything came out after the movie came out. A lot of people who saw the movie did not realize that it was a comic book. It was an, it, it yeah. was, it was an obscure comic book to begin with. It, it was sold as like, it, as you know, like a vigilante, like action horror kind of thing. And and of course then, you know, because of the tragedy with Brandon Lee, I mean, obviously when you couple that with the story it's telling, I mean, it, it took on a whole other level of, of significance in terms of, you know, dealing with tragedy and, you know, the, it, just, it just what is there beyond, you know, you know, what we see in life. And, uh yeah i mean the, the crow you, yeah what else can you say about it it's, it's just it it hit at the right the, the it the the story you know it, it's a turning point in comics and very very much so in terms of comic movies in the 90s i mean you talk about like comic movies in the 90s i mean this is definitely one of the highlights yeah definitely uh not like roger corman's ff that never got released yeah weren't there a couple of follow-ups to it where they had a few more people and one of them was a woman okay in the comics yes there was and I, and I know exactly what he's talking about, and I love this story. And if you read this comic, I think it's Kitchen Sink Press put this out. Um, I need to get those back again. Um, it's an, it's, I think it's an Indian woman or somebody on a reservation, if I can remember right. And she doesn't look the same. She has makeup on, but it's different. And like I was talking to people a couple of days ago, was the problem with the Crow sequels in the movies is they just tried to redo. Yeah, yeah. We did Eric Draven again, and that's not what the Crow was. Eric Draven looks like that, and he, they show it in the comic, and they show it exactly in the movie. It's actually a scene for scene where there's a mirror hanging, or there's a mirror and there's a mask with those that design, and that's the, that's the first thing he sees in his apartment when he crawls out of the grave and crawls up the stairs. That's the first thing he sees in the comic and in the movie, and that's why he chose that design. Each crow, as they are as a res, as they are resurrected, dude, I cannot talk today. As they are <laughs> resurrected. Or, or take on the image of their environment or what's happened to them or something. It's each, it's unique to each, each uh, person. The only thing common about each quote is the bird is it. And he yeah. exists throughout history. So well, and the one he's talking about is actually a great comic book. Well, and, that, like, and that's uh, I have a friend who's a really big, uh, really enamored with both the, the comic and the, and uh, the movie. And she's really trepidatious about the remake coming up with uh, Bill Skarsgård. I don't know. It's like, I think, I mean, he's got, he's, I mean, watch him in, you know, the Ed movies. I mean, he's like, he's such a great Pennywise. He doesn't even need makeup. So, um, I yeah. like at, at one point it was also going to have Jason Momoa attached. And I mean, I remember joking with her saying like, think about that is it's like, he would have been, he pulled out of it eventually, but the thing, he, Eric Draven, I don't know. It's like, I just could have seen him so much more as top dollar. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and plus, like I said, 
I have my doubts that this this new movie can get because like somebody mentioned in the chat earlier on, so much about what made the Crow movie what it was was the environment that it came out in. It was the height of alternative post post grunge alternative music. That soundtrack is one of the greatest, possibly the greatest soundtrack ever done. Um, Brandon Lee dying put a lot of spotlight on the movie that wasn't there. There was just so many things that fell into place for that movie to be a hit. I don't know if you can recreate that. And but I'm willing to give this movie a new chance because you know what? Maybe it will they will release a movie that is relevant to this environment that I'm living in right now and I may enjoy it. So I'm not I'm not completely uh, uh shitting on it, but I'm just I I you have a and it and it's done already, it just hasn't been released. I can't find a distributor, but um I just think they have a hard battle, but it's not an unwinnable battle. And by the way, a little bit of an extra trivia for the crow, anybody who's not aware that after uh you know Brandon Lee's tragedy. Um, which, you know, God rest. I mean, I, I grew up such a fan of, you know, Bruce Lee still. I mean, of course I very much, uh, with Brandon himself, I mean, seeing following him in rapid fire and showing out a little Tokyo. I mean, he had so much potential that was cut short. 40, 47 years old. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, it, it's, I mean, there's the talk about, he was the original choice to be Johnny Cage in the 95 mortal Kombat. I would love to see that performance. That would have been, I think he would have, I mean, I could just see him, you know, at that beginning there it, it, with, with those guys, like, this is where you fall down. <laughs> Yeah, but, I know. Um, but uh, but getting off of um, yeah, getting off of that. So you know, after his uh, you know, the, the tragedy befell him on the set, uh, you know, they had like a week left, I think, of filming, and uh, his scenes were completed by a fellow you may have heard of named uh, Chad Stahelski, who uh, you know trained. You know, he was really close friends with Brandon. He trained with him with Dan and Asanto, who of course was his father, Bruce's uh, uh, close friend and student. And uh, you know Chad would go on to be you know, whose you know, daughter, by the way, is on Ahsoka, which will be exactly yeah, Diana Leon Santo. And Chad would go on to be a prolific stuntman, stunt coordinator, fight choreographer. He would go on to double for Keanu in the Matrix movies, and would go on to direct him in the John Wick franchise. Yeah, and he, he's the way they did that was technology that was still new then, putting his face on the yeah, yeah, on the stairs. All right, uh, yes, rest in peace, man. Brandon Lee, man, twenty-seven years old. Brandon Lee. The, the, the bringing up of Brandon Lee, 70, 27 years old, literally about to launch his career and the atmosphere and break out from under Bruce Lee's shadow, who died at 33, 32. Um, he was right there. And when this if this thing happened with uh, Alec Baldwin and Russ, I, I immediately thought. Yeah, of every, every, his, yeah. Shannon, you know, his sister, like brought that up. It's like, why is this still happening? This is what happened to my yeah. brother. Yeah, why are we still using? Why are we still using? We have CGI. We can put the flame on there. And also, John Eric Hexum. John Eric Hexum was on a show called Voyagers, and he was on a show called Cover Up. Um, I, as a kid, watched these shows because that's all we had. We had three channels, and that was on CBS, and I watched him. John Eric Hexum was cool. He was playing in 1984. I've never, never, never. This is where I heard the term brain dead for the very first time. He's playing around with a a prop gun and he puts it up to his head and not realizing that a prop gun blank can still kill you at that rate. Yeah. I, I think I've heard of that story. He shot himself in the head. And that is the first time I heard. And I, I'm 12. Oh no, I'm, I'm nine or 10. I'm 10. And I heard the term brain death and he was young uh, for that to happen to him. So I, every time I think of these, there's a handful of people that I think about and, He's one of them. So, all right. So, yeah, I love the crow. Yes, that's the right answer. I'm just kidding. 